Okay, Hema, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nandu. Thanks for finding the time. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. Right. So, um, yeah, um, I'm quoting Jonas Salk here, the polio vaccine guy. If all mm -hmm. insects on Earth disappeared within 50 years, all life on Earth would end. If all human beings disappeared from the Earth within 50 years, all forms of life would flourish. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's quite relevant given the current scenario where humans have retreated indoors and wildlife seems to be flourishing. They've taken over the, you know, our cities, our roads. You know, there's so many, you, you do see all of these things, right? Where in various parts of the world, wildlife that you never encountered are on the streets. I mean, right. you see them everywhere. So they're reclaiming the spaces that we've encroached upon. Right, yeah, you, you're right. I mean, they've come back to claim their, uh, what they lost. Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Also, the atmosphere is also cleared up, I believe, in some place in... Uh, I'm not sure from where, but you could. See, they can now see the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. Aye. Not very far from Delhi, they can apparently on a clear morning, and, and these days the mornings are clearer than they used to be because there's no haze and fog and smog and everything. So apparently you do see the Himalayas on, on certain days, on a clear morning, if it's not cloudy. Yeah, <laughs> that's true, yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah, so... Uh, I was reading reading up something about the uh, kind of uh, drop in insect population that we've been having from, say, mm -hmm. uh, from, I believe, some place in Germany. They had these sticky flight traps and they took a, a biomass load, or I don't know what the technical term is, but when they checked it from 1989 up to now, over 27 years, there has been a decline of 76% of insects. Yes. That's, that is, I think, um, the trend in most parts of the world where such sampling has been done. Mm -hmm. So what we lack in this part of the world or in a lot of developing countries and in the underdeveloped world, which also hosts you know, a major proportion of the biodiversity, mm -hmm. is that we lack such systematic sampling. We have no idea about the losses. First of all, we have no idea about our biodiversity, which remains poorly documented. Uh, For example, if you were to take the Indian scenario, mm. a lot of the biodiversity that we know of, Indian biodiversity, let's talk about insects because insects are a very, very biodiverse group. Right. So a lot of this, uh, this knowledge or this documentation comes from, you know, a century when the British naturalists mm. made it a, you know, a hobby. And uh, also they began to very formalize, uh, you know, formalize these records of presence and absence of insects, the geographical distribution of insects and so on. Mm. They left a very, very nice record of what was there. But oh. from that, if you look at it after independence, there has been hardly any systematic study. And uh, people, for example, insect taxonomists, mm. you know, they are a vanishing tribe today. Nobody mm. wants to become an insect taxonomist. Mm. Right? So this is a skill. It's a hard learned skill. It takes years of specialization in order to be able to identify insects to the family order level or even to the genus and species level. Hmm. But that's a very, uh, most of these taxonomists, if you look at it, they are, most of them are retiring today or they've already retired. Hmm. And there is no, you know, younger generation to replace them because people have moved on. And that's a reflection of the job scenario and so on and so forth. So as a result of it, even the collections that we have are very old. Mm. Secondly, you know, a lot of the collections in India, there is the Botanical Survey or the Geological Survey of India or the Zoological Survey of India. Most of these collections are not very well maintained. They're not in the best of conditions. They should be much better documented and maintained, but, okay. they're, but they're languishing. So this is another issue that we are facing. First of all, we don't know what is there and then we haven't documented them properly and right. there has been no systematic follow-up further, you know? So these are issues, yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, as a layman, um, I remember that if you went for a long drive, you mm -hmm. had to come and clean your windshield probably once after every two hours of driving because of, I mean, it's, it's gross, but a lot of dead insects on your windshield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So overall, there is a decline. So from whatever data we know in various parts of the world, maybe, 
you know, from the US or it may be from the Europe where the best data comes from. I think there is a pattern, there is an underlying pattern that mm. there is a reduction in insect pollinators, for instance. Let's take the example of pollinators. These are beneficial insects and people, you know, will connect to them very easily because they give us food security, they pollinate our crops, they are responsible for wild plants blooming and so on and so forth. But uh, all of these studies have shown that if wherever there is historical data from a century or even half a century ago, and mm -hmm. then there's a follow-up study now, we see that you know those relationships between plants and pollinators have weakened. Mm -hmm. Some of those links have disappeared, mm -hmm. or they have all you know they've been replaced by other insects. So they have changed in form and structure over time. Right. But fortunately uh, for us, I mean, like in India, perhaps, and maybe a lot of, you know, the, the developing world, mm. we have a lot of biodiversity, we have a lot of pollinator species. Mm. So perhaps we can only hope, we can only hope this, mm. that even if there are a few species that are lost, perhaps these links are still flourishing. We don't know. For that, we need to validate it with our data, but right. that's something that's not so easily available, as I was just saying, yeah. Right. So uh, what would you attribute this to? Targeted killing by these pesticides or... Uh, what do you think is the, uh, if you had yes. one reason, what would it be? I think it's hard to say what is a single one reason. Uh -huh. But if I were to say what is a major stressor for pollinators or insects in general, uh -huh. it would be, I think, habitat modification. So because uh, we have, uh, a lot of our habitats have been replaced by farmlands, which are essentially monocultures, huge, you know, vast tra uh, tracts of monoculture. Right. And these crops are often not suitable for all insect species. For okay. example, if you have acres and acres of wheat or corn or rice in, you know, in Asia, these are not crops that pollinators will uh, find any resources on. Right? because they have been pollinated and they don't produce rewards that pollinators are looking for. So these are essentially areas that are not very suitable for insect pollinators. On the other hand, if you have a mixture of crops, you have your rice fields, but you also have your field margins, which have wild plants, which are, you know, produce flowers, and then this could act as uh, food for the pollinators. If you have some sort of a mixed strategy, then it's likely that pollinators will do well in such scenarios. But that's not what we see now. We see vast acreage of just one kind of crop, which is not suitable for pollinators in many cases. Okay. So I, I would say that it is the one big factor would be uh, modification of habitat or landscape modification. Again, but of course, there are other stressors. Yeah, like you said, pesticides. So uh, when, <laughs> when does an insect become a pest? So... If you talk about agricultural systems, right. uh, let us talk about, let's take the case of, you know, everybody connects to butterflies, they're beautiful insects, they're showy insects and so on and so forth. Right. A butterfly could pollinate your crops okay. because, uh, you know, they, uh, as they feed nectar, they could transfer pollen and they, they, are, they are good pollinators. Hmm. But at the same time, the same butterfly could also lay eggs on the same plant and those eggs will develop into caterpillars, which essentially chew up the leaves and, you know, destroy the crop. Right. So very often what you find is that you find the same insect that has a beneficial effect and it also has a negative effect. Right. right? But if you look at the overall scheme of things, uh -huh. some loss of crops, you know, you should give allowance, you know, for 10%, 20% right. of your crops are going to be eaten up. Right. Because here is a beneficial insect that's also providing a service, right. you know. Right. So, but are we willing to do that? Increasingly, we're not willing to do that. We're not willing to set aside, say, okay, some amount of losses are okay. Mm. Because here is a beneficial service. It's an ecosystem service that the butterfly is providing. Mm. But that, you know, the, 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 the philosophy of modern agriculture is about maximizing yield. Mm. You know, so right. then as a result, you have things spinning out of control. You have uh, pollinator declines on the one hand, and then you have, uh, you know, you have an increase in your pest populations on the other hand. So then everything spins out of balance. You right. know, so let's take the case of another pollinator, bees, for instance. Bees mm. uh, are supposed to be very excellent pollinators because they are carrying pollen back for their young ones. Mm. And in the process, they are affecting pollination. Mm. Now, uh, 
very often uh, when we use pesticides on plants, these have effects on bees. And we have lots of studies that have shown that bees can be affected by certain, you know, threshold doses of pesticides that are applied on plants. Mm -hmm. And this can ha have an effect on development, wing development, muscle development, memory, learning in bees, because mm -hmm. they have to learn to identify a plant, a flower, in order to make subsequent visits to that particular flower. So all of this can get affected. And right. there are lots of studies that have shown this to be the case. Oh. So, yeah, so coming back to your question, yeah, it is, um, I think that there has to be a balance. Mm. And we should allow some amount, we should be prepared to lose some amount of whatever we grow to, right. you know, insects for their food and for their sustenance. So I think it's all about a balance. It's about finding a balance. Right. So Absolutely. the farmer has to be educated in other words. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the whole philosophy of farming has to be, has to, has to change. Right. You know, it can't be just about yield maximization. Right. It can't be just about that. Right. Uh, yeah, when you were talking about bees and uh, how they have they kind of uh, uh, communicate with the other bees where uh, this particular flower is found or whatever. So do they have some kind of a, a, a kind of a collective intelligence? How does it work? Because a bee by itself, it's, uh, I'm guessing, uh, compared to the, the size of the brain must be microscopic. So how does it get this intelligence? Is that a collective intelligence? How does this work? So the, the funny thing about bees, and I think when you talk about collective intelligence, you're talking about honeybees. Right. There are lots and lots of bees that don't live in these large groups uh, like honeybees do. But honeybees are important pollinators across the globe. Okay. So in honeybees, what happens is that, um, and this is very early work from this, uh, from this scientist called Carl von Frisch, who mm -hmm. won the Nobel Prize for this discovery, where he showed that a honeybee that is able to forage and find food comes back to the hive mm. and she informs nest mates or hive mates about the location of food. Right. Okay, and the way she does this is through a symbolic language. Mm. It's called the bee dance or the waggle dance. Waggle dance so yes. the foraging, yeah, the waggle dance. Yeah. So and the, the waggle dance actually codes information uh. on the direction to the food source uh. as well as the distance to the food source. Right. So therefore, what happens is that the follower bees who are watching this dancing bee who has been successful in finding food mm -hmm. will then observe, you know, in what direction and also the intensity of the waggle dance. And then they will be able, able to take off in the same direction and find the food resource. Mm -hmm. So here what happens is that this is a way in which the colony achieves efficiency. Mm -hmm. Instead, you can imagine an alternate scenario where each bee has to individually find food. And mm -hmm. that's not a very efficient uh, you know, way to feed a large colony of thousands of bees, right? But yeah. if somebody is telling you where to go, so then it makes the whole, you know, the supply chain very efficient. True. So yeah. that is what we call, I mean, you can think about it as collective intelligence, though per se, there is no intelligence that is involved. These are hard hardwired behaviors. Okay. You know, the dance is a hardwired behavior. And, you know, uh, observing the dance or picking up information from the dance is also a hard wired behavior. So in that sense, it's not so much as how we think about intelligence. But when yeah. you say uh, hard wired, you, are you saying that it's, uh, it's in the genes? Is it a genetic? Inf it is genetically coded. It is genetically coded. Okay. You know, the vagal dance, the, the components of the vagal dance, it's genetically coded and people know that. Uh -huh. Right. So they don't know the specific genes that are responsible for this, you know, for the waggle dance and so on. But uh -huh. of course, it is hardwired information because every species has, uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, has its waggle dance. Uh -huh. And it's also, uh, you know, in, in areas like in, in Asia where you have several species of honeybees, uh -huh. there are studies that have shown that one, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, the, the dance of one particular bee species can also be sort of followed and observed and understood by another species. So there is this transfer of information, not just within the hive, but also across species, which is, I think, very fascinating. Yes, it is. It was almost like they have a universal language what we don't have, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, the inner, uh, inner circle of bees that are kind of watching this dance, mm -hmm information throughout the hive by is, is that true did i did i read right uh, so what happens is that i think we know that uh, if there is a dancing bee 
then she's observed by something like four to eight bees. Okay. Right. Who 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 surround this bee and they're watching this bee. Uh-huh. Well, when I say watching, we don't know what exactly is the information they're perceiving. Okay. Is that a physical it could contact? be. it could be physical contact it okay. could be vibrations that are transmitted through the comb surface mm-hmm. it could be a combination of these things it could be smells of the flowers so it's likely to be very multimodal mm. right so they could be uh, perceiving all this information there could be visual information there could be olfactory information there could be vibrational information mm. so it's not really clear how this information is transmitted Mm-hmm. but using very controlled experiments people have shown that these bees can be recruited to the same resource mm. so yeah so i think uh, that's very fascinating and uh, i think this work by von frisch it led to subsequent lot of interest in you know in honey bees and even led to people recognizing that honey bees are special you know uh. and uh, you know has a very very important role to play in terms of conservation of bees in general because today we use this same uh, you know dance as a tool to understand in different landscapes how far are the bees going where are they going how are they using landscapes and so on so this is the applied you know part of this behavior so we take this behavior and we try to apply it and then try to see what do we get how do how do different landscapes how valuable are different landscapes to bees and so on yeah wow so, i mean considering that uh, they have to build in a height component also to it right it's not just the uh, uh, it's not going straight and take a left and take the second right kind of thing you also know how high and how low you got to go yeah so we're not sure it codes for height you know so we don't know if it codes for height because experiments that were done by placing artificial feeders containing sucrose uh. and then you have bees that are recruited there Uh-huh. so if you were to place it along a building or a long in a on a long pole so mm-hmm. then we are not sure it but it gets you pretty close to the point you know where the food is and then there you can do a random search or you follow scent trails and so on and so forth and it can help you to reach the resource so oh. it we, we don't have information except for one species perhaps but even that it's not very clear to what extent they use altitudinal information oh. but it gets you to the point yeah yeah okay. pretty close to the point and uh, during one of your interviews i had uh, i saw the the interviewer asking you uh, about starlight navigation for the bees mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. there was any going on and you would have some information soon but whether this happens or not because you said that the bees uh, now start flying in the night to to kind of distribute the load yeah yeah so there are a few species of bees uh-huh. they just a few species which have uh, you know made this transition to a nocturnal lifestyle okay. okay so most bees are diurnal and we know that you know in order to convey all this information right. about you know location of food or even to navigate from the nest and then because many bees go kilometers to find food and then they have to find the way back to the nest successfully right they can't afford to get lost so um, so therefore it becomes interesting to try and ask mm. you know why is it that some bees have turned nocturnal okay when the majority of bees are diurnal and then we try to say okay what might be the conditions that led to nocturnality could mm-hmm. it be just that they were trying to escape from competition you know from other bees and other pollinators and flower feeding insects or mm-hmm. could it be a response to predation so the night environment is you know is relatively safer perhaps so mm-hmm. we don't know exactly that yeah. it could be both of these we don't know exactly why they have evolved nocturnality but the fact that they have evolved nocturnality is fascinating and it's quite remarkable mm. because typically bees if you look at bees mm. they're very visual right? right they can see color beautifully they perceive all the colors in flowers and so on uh-huh. uh, but um, you know uh, you do expect that their eyes the optics of the bee eyes are not very suitable for low light levels okay so their optics are not very efficient at low light levels in spite but of bees compound. sorry in spite of compound eyes yeah compound eyes are not very great in terms of resolution oh. you know so our eyes are very good with resolving fine differences oh okay. but compound eyes are not that great with resolving uh, you know are not very well resolved they have very poor resolution okay okay so uh, therefore it's interesting that some bees are able to navigate in the uh, it, in, in low light conditions and and in india we've looked at this particular carpenter bee 
mm. that can actually uh, go down to starlight even on moonless nights when it's pretty dark mm. they can forage they can find their way successfully back to the nest we don't know what are the cues they use mm. they perhaps they use uh, you know some sort of uh, cues in the sky polarized light we're not sure mm. maybe they use canopy patterns maybe they use landmarks you know against uh, you know maybe a distant hill or a tree we don't know how exactly they do it but they do it which is quite impressive it's and not they're doing some sorry i'm sorry I, i cut you what were you saying no and then uh, what i was saying is that we are trying to understand how exactly the, they're able to navigate in the nocturnal environment yeah okay so um yeah uh, is there a, is there a chance that they might have some I mean i'm just shooting my mouth here but uh iron he- iron particles in the head and they get 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 aligned to the magnetic north or some such thing like i believe some pigeons do that yeah yeah bees also have magnetite right oh. in so they are known to have magnetite Oh. we are not sure to what extent they can use it to you know sort of orient themselves to the magnetic field uh-huh. but i wouldn't be surprised because you know if you put yourself uh, if you think of yourself as a bee oh. uh, that is trying to uh, navigate through a complex environment and you have to come back home mm. you would use anything you can use you would use vision you would use olfaction you would use uh, magnetic field if that is possible Right. right you would use anything that is possible you would use uh, the sun's position you would use polarized light so it's always better to have a bag of tricks than to rely on one or two tricks yeah. right so i wouldn't be surprised and in fact in other insects for example in moths there was a recent study that mm. shows that they could actually use the magnetic field and in addition to the magnetic field we have uh, beetles in south africa Mm. that can use the the pattern the starlight the star pa- the patterns of the the star or the what do you call it the celestial patterns oh. you know in order to navigate back and forth mm. so i'm not surprised that uh, i wouldn't be surprised if the bees can do the same thing <laughs> and humans think they are the superior species huh? <laughs> we rely on gps yeah. <laughs> and ask people do you know how to <laughs> 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 the other thing was about uh, how each uh, like you have the foragers you have uh, the ones who take care of the queen and the ones who uh, clean the hive so how does this how do they take on these roles are they kind of born that way is there something like uh, genetically they are uh, they do this task and if they do it are these are these tasks swappable in the sense that a forager could he become a guard and things like that Yeah, so what typically happens from what we know is that um in honey bee colonies mm. uh the workers uh the queen is the reproductive individual right so she her job is to lay eggs the workers take care of everything else in the colony so right. usually when a worker bee is born mm. she starts her experience by work experience by doing jobs within the hive so typically she would help in uh you know comb construction or she would help in you know taking care of feeding the larvae mm-hmm. right uh, or she would take care of hygiene activities within the within the nest or within the hive mm-hmm. or she would take care of colony defense by waiting you must have seen at the entrance there might be a few bees hanging out for you know to uh, to defend the colony for instance oh. and then as she ages or when she becomes older then the older workers will take on the job of foraging in the outside environment okay okay so it's with experience so you can see that there is this ontogeny or this age age based division of labor okay. when they start doing in house activities and then they graduate into doing you know the the foraging in the landscape and so on and so forth okay. so that is how it is in most species there may be differences in the face of each activity mm-hmm. and there are some species where they can do more than one activity at the same time Mm-hmm. but usually you see this progression ending with becoming a forager and then shortly after that uh, you know typically maybe a forager is active for about 10 days mm-hmm. or you know two weeks and then it depends on the species and the conditions but mm-hmm. then after that usually the bee dies oh okay so yeah. what exactly is the life span of an average uh, life span of a bee so it might in some in uh, some species it could be uh, you know as short as 3 weeks Mm-hmm. and there are others where it could be maybe about 
45 days or even 60 days. Okay. So it varies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what what exactly happens when when uh, you know uh, bees don't necessarily have to go to the same species of plants every time to get the reward right and the nectar and things so mm -hmm. they they probably would fly uh, i'm just giving a, a example from the top of my head they probably land on a jasmine flower and then go on to a shoe flower and so on and so forth so if they carry the pollen from the jasmine flower to the shoe flower it's of no use yes yeah in terms of the uh, reproduction, so how does this work? How does how does this thing work? Yeah, so uh, typically a uh, lot of uh, pollinators show a behavior that we call as a flower, flower constancy. Okay, what this essentially means is that imagine that there's a bee that's flying through the environment and she encounters, let's say, a bunch of you know different floral species. Let's say ten to twelve species. Hmm. Now she would pick on one species. Hmm. Okay, uh, and then she would visit just that species in sequence. Okay, oh. so she would go from flower to flower and from plant to plant, visiting that one species, and this is what we call as floral uh, constancy. Okay, oh. and that helps the plant because uh, you know there's no the pollen that's transferred is the proper pollen, and it helps in fertilization and pollination. And the, what is the benefit to the bee in doing this? Does it make sense for the bee to do this behavior? Yes, from what we know, it makes sense for the for the bee to uh, you know be flower constant mm -hmm. because they can only store. You you just mentioned early on that the bee has a very tiny brain, right? <laughs> and a very right. tiny brain is constrained by how much information can be stored. Right. So therefore, it be, makes foraging much more efficient to mm. store you know, the, or to memorize the features of what is a flower that they want to visit mm. and then pick just those flowers. So it makes the whole foraging process much more efficient. You oh. know, the handling time for flowers also varies. So you become a specialist or you get better and better at a task when you do the same thing repeatedly, right. you know. Right. So let's say you take, uh, you know, a flower, which is say a chrysanthemum or something like that. So you just visit chrysanthemum after chrysanthemum after chrysanthemum. So it helps the plant and it helps the bee in the right. process. Right. And so it just leads to efficiency for both partners that are involved. Okay, so that is, that's something that a lot of pollinators do. And these are the, the, these are the benefits to the bee. And of course, the plant is benefited because it gets, you know, fruit formation and fitness. Hmm. It's amazing, isn't it? How, how these things so beautifully dovetail. Absolutely. Absolutely. It doesn't, yeah, yeah. It doesn't fail to sort of fascinate me even today. <laughs> In fact, even as we talk, I have a student who's just running experiments. Uh -huh. He's doing controlled experiments because these experiments are very hard to demonstrate in the field. Uh -huh. So he's trying to do experiments in the laboratory where he feeds them. Uh, we keep beehives in the laboratory uh -huh. and then we have this artificial flower arena. And uh -huh. then he's trying to check this flower constancy behavior, mm. okay, but where he has blue flowers and yellow flowers, artificial flowers, of course, mm. and then they're filled with sucrose solution. And then we try to look whether the bee is showing this floral constancy. Maybe it picks up a blue flower and you would expect them to just visit blue flowers in a sequence, right? Mm. But mm. then what he does is he tries to uh, sort of vary the rewards in the blue and the yellow. And mm -hmm. then try to see what effect that has on constancy. At one, at what point do they give up on the blue flowers and switch to something else? Because they uh, have to keep on sampling the environment, right? Because a flower is not going to be available all the time. Everything, every species has a certain flowering season. So uh, at, right. when do they start sampling? You know, to make and how do they make the shift? You know, mm -hmm. are they do they do this because they are risk averse, or do they do this when the rewards become very unpredictable? You know, so you, you keep the rewards uniform or you vary the amount of rewards, say the concentration and the volume of sucrose. And at that point, you know, do they then decide that now I have to sample more widely and start searching other flowers? So these are the kinds of questions that I have a new PhD student who is just trying to answer these questions. Yeah. <laughs> Even as we talk. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so that, it's, it's very, it's very pertinent that you asked me this question just now. <laughs> there's an active updating going on in which case, right? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to hit myself for saying uh, the bees have a small brain. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, talking about this, I, I remember reading about uh, 
uh, rather watching a, a television show where I think it was in Nepal. There is a stripe called Gurung, mm-hmm. who climb you know vertical um, yes. cliffs and go and yes. get hives right on top, and then yeah. and that uh, honey uh, makes you high. Mm-hmm. It gives you mm-hmm. Kind of a uh, like uh, you know LSD, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, so there are yeah 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 so um yeah so nectar from various flowers have various compounds in them mm. uh, for example uh, there was a study a few years back which showed that uh, some fl- flowers have caffeine in the nectar mm. and, and that was a uh, it, that study got a lot of attention because they showed that um, you know so they tried to say okay why why is there caffeine in the nectar Mm. right because it's pollinators that feed on nectar typically and why is there feed there so mm. then they did these experiments to show that bees have a preference for uh, nectar that contains caffeine as compared to just plain nectar okay. you know and then they went on a step ahead to show that uh, bees that were consuming uh, nectar that was uh, you know that contained caffeine mm. were had you know better memory and better learning than bees that uh, you know we're consuming just plain nectar so that's a good thing for coffee lovers like me and perhaps you <laughs> wow. yeah so yeah so there are lots of uh, so similar to caffeine there are other compounds in the nectar some of which could be toxic right but some of which could also act like you said it could have uh, effects on various things yeah right uh, how far has this uh, commercial beef farming um, impacted uh, the bees as such i mean is it a good thing for the bees or the bad thing is it a bad thing where they put so, them on those big crates and they kind of commercial yeah 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 so i think commercial beekeeping the way it is practiced in europe or in the us especially where mm. they transport these bees in trucks you know mm. they go from you know pollinating your almond crops and then they take in somewhere else when there's something else flowering so that has uh, it's very stressful for the bees of course and mm. these colonies are kept in very high densities mm. yeah. okay so it's very easy for disease to be transmitted mm. so there are there are issues of this sort and you know about you know there were there was a colony collapse and so on and so forth yeah. uh in in many other parts of the world where agriculture is still a family kind of a, a run enterprise mm. right and farm holdings are typically small maybe mm. within 5 acres or so mm. so there you find that uh, there you don't find this kind of organized large scale honey bee keeping mm. yeah so there is some incentive to keep honey bees uh, but that is kept mainly you know for to help farmers to sort of augment incomes you know from the honey that's produced mm. but a lot of agriculture for, for in the indian context especially we mm. have we grow a lot of vegetable crops and fruit crops and so on a lot of this is serviced by wild bees we don't know exactly for you know uh, which are the wild bees in many cases uh-huh. we don't know exactly mm. but a lot of this is uh, you know pollinated by the wild bees uh, solitary bees honey bees that are you know the wild species of honey bees there's very little that is you know contributed to by this managed uh, you know honey bees kept in hive boxes unlike in the us yeah. right. so so by colony collapse you were talking about ccd that colony collapse disorder yes yes yeah 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 wow <laughs> i don't know how far true this is but i believe now bees are being used to fight crime have you heard of that uh-huh. they act, I, think- i believe they put them into uh, small little things like test tubes and uh, they have some infrared way of detecting and when yeah. they well an explosive yeah it, it the tongues out yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so I mean, can be, so i think you know this is a behavior that we use routinely in the lab so what we do is that we we harness the bee in a little tube right uh-huh. and then we sort of take a little stick with some sucrose solution uh-huh. and we feed it to the bee the stationary bee uh-huh. right and the minute you do this two or three times the minute you bring a stick close by they would exert their tongues out they would put their tongues out essentially like your dog or something like that mm. right so they expect they they learn to associate this movement or a stick 
with you know food or reward like the pavlovian you must have heard of pavlov's dog so very similar to that Uh, so and then they would uh, you know put out their tongues uh, and they would you know expect in expectation of reward mm. so you can train them to anything if you were to associate the smell of a particular explosive or a particular drug mm. you know with a reward mm. you can train them very easily to mm. expect a reward and so therefore they would go searching for it so this is a it's a very simple paradigm and it's based on the pavlovian paradigm so i'm i'm pretty sure they can learn because they can learn complex smells right you can make them you can you can teach them uh, to to be attracted to certain smells you can teach them to be uh, aversive to certain smells you know all of that is possible because they learn very very quickly just you know in our experience they it just requires about two or three trainings and they learn of course there's variation between bees mm-hmm. but in general i would say that on an average bee would learn in about three or four trials you know whatever you want uh, the bee to learn so 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 it's it's based on that simple paradigm so they can smell explosives they can smell uh, drugs you know and they can be uh, you know trained to detect all of this very interesting i mean it's quicker than a dog i guess <laughs> you don't have to take them for walks so yeah. that's yeah or out for a pee yeah, yeah right. they don't mess up your house too yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. so last question <clears throat> how many times have you been stung by a bee <laughs> oh i i don't keep count <laughs> but, but this is one thing that sort of uh, you know puts off young students Right. because um, they they are afraid of bee stings right most people are not allergic to it but of course there could be people who can develop a very bad allergy mm-hmm. but what we do in the lab is that we take all precautions so okay. we uh, students are well equipped to deal with this they are wearing a bee suit when they work with bees and handling bees and we know we can predict you know from the behavior of bees we know when they are aggressive and so we would not go near the hive you know or do anything or try to you know get close Uh, so i think uh, i must have been stung when i was learning how to handle bees but now i rarely get stung okay so i've learned something <laughs> even though not as fast as a bee <laughs> so does, is it true that the bee sting remains in your skin and that leave, that uh, gives out a fair hormone where other bees kind of zone in mm, uh, the sting per se doesn't give out a pheromone okay. but uh, when does a bee sting a bee stings when she is alarmed Okay. and she releases these pheromones into the air okay, okay? Yeah. and so that attracts other bees and they are so it raises the sort of the alertness of the colony in general and so therefore you could find that there will be multiple bees that will come and sting the so called the perceived threat so that can happen yeah but stinging is a last resort for bees because they would die shortly after so a sting yeah so because the the digestive tract of the bee is attached to the string uh, to the sting essentially so when they leave the sting behind oh. so they are ripping off that part of their uh, you know the di- digestive system and so essentially the bee is not going to survive for too long so it's the it's the last line of defense there are other ways of defending for example they show a shimmering behavior so that's like a warning behavior don't come too close uh-huh. or i I've, i've noticed you you know so these are all what they would do first but stinging is like you know the f- ultimate final step so yeah like like those kamikaze pilots going down absolutely that's what they remind me of yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> so hema thank you so much it has been a wealth of information and <clears throat> it's been so enjoyable speaking with you i'm kind of excited by uh you know how nature kind of interacts it's like a big huge web you know at every point it it one movement justifies the other i think uh, i mean words fail me actually honestly because it's so- i think you your description is very very accurate what you just said because i think there are you know there are these distinct life forms and in some way these life forms are connected we know about some of those links we know about how strong some of those links are but there are several links that we are not we we are not aware of and we haven't documented or we don't we don't even know mm. and many of those links between different species are fast unraveling mm. right in a rapidly changing world they are unraveling and we don't even know what consequence they have for this the for the structure of the web right is the web going to be resilient 
and to what point is it going to be resilient Right. Right. So when when I study pollination networks, we are essentially looking at networks because there are lots of pollinators connected to plants and plants connected to pollinators. It's a mess, right. but we don't we know that some of those links are very critical and some may be less critical. Right. But we don't understand, you know, if you were to perturb some of those links, what happens to the structure is mm. something that we can only fathom, and we don't have the luxury to sort of. uh you know see this happening because very often it goes unnoticed mm. and we can only try like i started out by saying only if we have historical data can we look at those links right. you know, at some point in the past and then now and then see what is happening and then try to decipher what could happen right. so but i think you hit the nail on the head by saying that you know it is a tangled mess it is a web and mm. there are interactions and you know some of which we don't even recognize and mm. so therefore we should do our best to try and see how we can protect these interactions that go on that we don't even fathom right yeah. well, i think that would be yeah a net sum zero kind of game right Just yes anything that yeah. up a bit the other one kind of takes it over and brings it back yes. to yes 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 And I'm I, sure there is inbuilt resilience. Okay, uh, it can't be such a fragile network. Okay, these yeah. interactions are not that fragile because otherwise it would have ceased to exist by now. Right. So there is resilience, but how much of resilience is the question? I think. Yeah. So because the the thing I was saying is the uh, the the flowers need the bee for pollination for it to propagate, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. And so much. And I think we humans are the aberration. <laughs> anyway yeah thank you so much thank you so much nandu it was a pleasure talking to you thank you